Hello everyone, it's Nandra Masugi here. I'd like to thank you and welcome you all to our authentic um, personal branding webinar. I'm so excited about um, our conversation today because personal branding is something that touches every one of us. So whether you know it or not, personal branding touches every one of us. It doesn't matter where you are, you could be in Zimbabwe like myself, or Lida in America or the UK, wherever it is, personal branding is impacting your life. So, you, you know, this is really going to be a good discussion. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And I would like to, today, with us today, we have um, Lida Citrion. Um, she is in, in, in Colorado. Welcome, Lida. Thank you for coming on board our conversation today. Always, and I'm always so a pleasure to see you. To you. <laughs> you know, um, just, just for, for our audience, uh, you know, Lida and I met six years ago. I went on a US Department of State uh, business exchange program. And one of the states we went to was um, Colorado. So I got there and I wanted to meet somebody who's in my line of work, you know, personal branding, personal development. So I Googled and uh, Lida's name um, just popped up and it, it was the one that was just standing out. So I, I contacted her and she responded and I was so excited. So um, she responded and we met up. And I remember on the day that we actually met, she had a presentation and I sat in and listened to what she had to say. It was just incredible. And after that, we had, you know, we went out for drinks and the rest is history. And here we are six years later on a webinar together. How incredible is that? It's so I'm really excited so about this. So, cool. <laughs> so thank you so much, Lisa. I mean, um, I haven't introduced you. I've just welcomed you. So I'm going to give you this opportunity to just introduce yourself. Oh, perfect. And yes, around the world and look at us coming together in this format. It's so mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Lita Citroen and I run a company here based in Colorado called Lita 360. And what I'm really in the business of doing is helping global executives, professionals, entrepreneurs, and even military veterans tell their story make themselves compelling and relevant in really complex markets. I have clients all over the world uh, in, you know, in Argentina and Poland and Australia and um, Holland all over. And what we're all dealing with is how do we make people know who we are and value us for what we can offer? That's personal branding. So I'm known as a personal branding specialist and reputation management expert. I've done a TED talk and now a Google talk, uh, which just yeah. launched yesterday. I'm so excited. And I've written several books. I have four books already to date and one coming out next year, which is all on the topic of what we're going to talk about today. That book is called Control the Narrative. It's all about executives, positioning, um, global, you know, social media. How does all that work if you're trying to build a brand? change your brand, move it from one industry to another, or even repair your reputation, which is a specialty that I offer. I'm a LinkedIn learning instructor, so I have several courses on LinkedIn learning. And I'm just really passionate about working with people who are motivated to take control of their career and their legacy through managing perception. Mm -hmm. That is amazing work. That is really amazing work, um, Lisa. Thank you for that. And um, today, because of time constraints, I know we were, this is just going to be an appetizer reading. We're just going to scratch the surface. So to all those who are listening in Nomatemba, Dovo, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate you being coming on board. So if there are questions that we're not going to be able to address, you know, uh, by the end of our discussion today, the book is coming out and, um, um, and as well as the courses that are on LinkedIn. So please, um, should there be anything that you need clarity on? The resources are there and the book is coming out in May. And yeah. Esther, thank you so much for coming on board. Thank you for coming on board. So we're going to start talking about personal branding. Now, personal branding, authentic personal branding, it's, you know, some people are not really comfortable with the concept because sometimes people think, uh, you know, it's, oh, it's a little superficial because it's more about, you know, your self-promotion, and people may not be comfortable with that. Some people think it's just for celebrities. So maybe let's kind of break it down a little bit. Let's start off with defining what personal branding really is. 
Well, I can tell you what it isn't. <laughs> um, it isn't just for celebrities and politicians. I, I've been doing this work solely on my own now for 12 and a half years. I I've worked in corporate doing it before and I have not worked with a celebrity or a politician. That's, that's kind of a rule that I make. I like to work with real people, entrepreneurs, business professionals, people who are trying to get their message out. And what personal branding is, is an experience right? Yeah. Brand is an experience. Marketing is where we tell people what to do. Act fast, call today, buy this. But branding is where we set the expectation of what it's going to feel like to work with us, hire us, contract with us, or invest in us. So the brand is really an experience. And what I always tell people is everyone has a personal brand by design or by default. So the people that you are already working with, collaborating with, being in conversation with, they have formed perception about you. Are, are you the person they go to for a specific set of skills or experiences? Or are you the person they roll their eyes and dread when you walk into a meeting? There's feelings we have about people and those feelings drive behavior because we know that people make buying decisions because they act on logic, right? I need a car or I need a cup of coffee, but we buy on emotion. We buy on brand. If something makes us feel a certain way, and that feeling is attractive, then we're drawn to it. So when we think about people, we have to remember that all of us are competing, right? We're competing for market share, we're competing for jobs, we're competing for opportunities. And, and if we all look the same, then how is somebody going to decide? They're gonna decide because one person makes them feel a certain way, makes them feel safe, makes them feel excited, makes them feel intrigued or, or validated or valued. And that feeling is what makes people actually convert into buying. Mm -hmm. That's how I define personal brand. How do you define personal brand? I agree with that, um, Alida. And I just to add on to that, you know, you talk about how a brand is, a, is an experience. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also, you know, it's a bundle of benefits and uh, a promise of value. And it's an asset, you know, that needs to be to be managed. So when we're talking about personal branding, it's really, it's a process um, that requires one to understand who they really are. So you've got to know what your personality, your passion, your values, mm -hmm. your skills, and then leverage on those to differentiate yourself and to create value and compelling experiences for your tribe. And, and, uh, and in the process, build a powerful name for yourself. So I think that- Oh, 100 percent. And those things already happen. It's just whether you're designing them and driving them or other people are just forming their own judgments and perception. And they may be wrong. They may be misinformed. They may not have enough information. And you're giving away your power if you let that happen. Yes, that is so true. That is very true. And I agree with that. And um, you know, I, I like what you said when we were in conversation during the week when you said um, personal branding is not about perfection, but consistency. I love that. And that stuck to me. You know, maybe you can just tell us a little more about that. Well, we're human beings. We're all going to make mistakes, but it is about being consistent. So I, I had a conversation yesterday with someone who said, I went to your website. I looked at your LinkedIn. I talked to people who know you. I read some of the things you wrote and I had a sense of what kind of conversation you and I were going to have. That's consistency, yeah. right? Not, none of it's perfect. I have a typo in two of my books on those shelves. And trust me, my father found them right away. <laughs> but you know, so I'm not perfect, yeah. but, but I am consistent. And if I'm not consistent, my audience starts questioning. So what we where that shows up is people think they have to be perfect on LinkedIn and funny mm -hmm. on Facebook but they're not either of them in person. And so we get confused and we don't know which one to trust. So it's all about just being consistent. You're not going to say the same thing on LinkedIn, maybe that you'd say on Facebook, but I don't want to see different people. I want to yes. see the same person, just different sides yes. of you. Yes, that's it. Thank you for that. And uh, to those who are listening in, I know Loma Timbalove is a marketer. You know, if you want to say something about personal branding and what it is to you and, and Esther, please can you join the conversation, ladies, please join the conversation. So today we're talking about authentic personal branding. Uh, she says, Noma Tembendo says, I like the fact that not managing my brand is giving my power away. 
That oh, is so 100%. Think about it. Think about it this way, right? We're, we're all on this conveyor belt, right? I mean, time doesn't, isn't faster for you or slower for me. So we're all moving at the same pace. And there's a finality to it. And at the finality, we only can look back because we don't have forward. And what happens then is we have legacy. So people remember you for something. And what I, what I, an exercise I take my audiences through is to think about the end, to actually imagine what that looks like at the end and then say to yourself, what experience do you want people to remember about you, right? How did you make them feel? What, what was it like to work with you or hire you or be hired by you or invest in your business? And once we have a picture of what you really want that to look like, you mm -hmm. start from today and you move in that direction. Yes. So personal brand can be a little aspirational. It, it can be a little, um, you know, of a dream, but you get to start living that now and you move in a direction that's focused mm -hmm. and consistent and confident. And yes. that's when it starts working. I like that. You know, begin with the end in mind. You got to begin Always. With the end in mind and then, and, and, and and move forward. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about, I, I also want to kind of uh, focus on the authenticness of personal brand because we are talking about, uh, we're talking about um, authentic personal branding. Right. So maybe let's talk a little bit about what it means, you know, when we're talking about not just personal branding, but authentic personal. Well, you mentioned Nonto, an interesting word, and that is values. Right. Mm -hmm. So the process of building your brand starts with values because th the only way to build credibility for a brand is mm -hmm. to have values match action. So what you tell me you believe in, you would fight for, you, you know, you are so fundamentally committed to, if that's not shown in evidence and proof, I don't believe it. So you don't get credibility. So, you know, values plus action equals credibility. And yeah. values is often where our authenticity gets tangled up. Because if, if I ask a military audience, right, if I'm on an installation and I've got a hundred, you know, 500 veterans or service members in front of me, and I say, what are your values? I'll hear honor, loyalty, duty, service, integrity, military values, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask a professional, what are your values? I might hear the values their parents taught them or the values that their social media influencers say are important or their spouse or their community, their culture. But this is an opportunity because it's personal branding to strip all that away and say, what are your values yeah. as a man, as a woman, as an individual? What do you believe in? What would you fight for? What is so core to your moral DNA that it helps you decide, yes, no, this feels right, this seems wrong, this, this is what I'll move towards and this is what I'm gonna move away from. That's what your values are. And, and we have to live those authentically because no one else, we're not accountable to anyone else, we're accountable to ourselves. So living authentic, Brand means living authentic values. Yeah. And that's a very difficult process. I always say personal branding is really simple, but it is not easy. <laughs> it yeah. is not easy because as you mentioned, you have to be an expert on you. You have to know what your values are. And then the second part of the equation is plus action. You have to tell people about that. You have to tell people why you're doing the things you're doing. Uh, I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but um, when I first started working in the military, I, I my values were very clear. Gratitude and generosity. Those are two values that really anchor everything I do. I have other values, of course, but those are the two big ones for, for my career and my brand. And so working with military veterans who are struggling to find their brand or even understand what a brand was felt perfectly natural but I had zero credibility because I had the values, but I had no proof that those values were leading me to action. It wasn't until, you know, years went by that I was, was speaking at conferences and often paying my own way to get there, still do, uh, <laughs> writing articles, writing books, coaching anyone who called me, giving all of this away for free, that, I, that the community, right, the people I wanted to influence said, she says this is important and now she's showing us proof. But I had to tell people my why. 
I had to connect it to my values. Every time I stand in front of a military audience, I make sure I say, I do this work because I am grateful for your service to our nation. Mm -hmm. They wore the uniform. As an American, I'm proud, but I did nothing to deserve this. They did. They have ensured my freedom. So I have to make that connection or they, they might not. And that's how you get credibility. I like that. I, I really do. Um, and, I, and, and I think also the issue, I think it's, just, it's about staying in a lane really and being true to who you are, your strengths and um, you know, what your strengths are, what are your abilities and, and being able to, like I said earlier on, leverage on those. So being, you know, being true to who you are and using what you have to actually to show up and to make a difference um, in your community. Um, Esther says, uh, very insightful. I like the point of consistency. Women often struggle with the professional and personal side. So reflection becomes important on the brand journey. Mm. I like that. So maybe our next question, actually, we can, we can um, talk about the professional and personal side of branding. Um, yeah. Should we differentiate the two? Uh, should I have a professional brand and then a personal brand or, you know, is it just one? Maybe let's talk about that a little bit. You know, that's a lot of work, right? Because it's already a lot of work to build a brand. And now you're talking about having maybe a professional brand, a personal brand, a corporate brand, an entrepreneur. Brand. Wow. I mean, if people have that kind of time, I want to know, you know, what they have for breakfast. Um, I, I don't find that it works that way. That, that's not my experience. I don't, I don't promote that we should have these different hats that we put on and change into different people. But as I mentioned before, we show up differently, right? Yeah. If I'm having a conversation with my team, I'm going to speak to them because we all know each other. We've worked together. We, you know, we've, we've had our goods and bads and we trust each other. If I'm speaking to an audience of a couple thousand people, I don't know them yet. So I might speak to them a little differently. If I'm speaking to my husband, I'm going to speak a little. We speak differently naturally, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't be different people. Yes. So it, the brand is the same. Mm -hmm. How you share something on LinkedIn is going to be more professional because LinkedIn is a more professional audience, how you share it on Instagram or Facebook or with your family over a holiday meal is going to always be different. Yes. So I'm not a fan that, that people segment them. We just have to understand there's appropriateness. We yes. speak to people differently because it's appropriate to do so, but we should always be the same person. Mm -hmm. That's how you build I, trust. I agree with that. I think really, I mean, at your core, you are really one person. So what changes is, is the context. So mm -hmm. like you're saying, at work, you may need to be a little stricter. At home, you're more relaxed. But your values are the same. Your beliefs and your philosophies make you who you are. So mm -hmm. you are one person, but maybe just a different context, I think. Um, I would put it that way as well. Uh, and then now maybe to move on to another question that ties in a little bit is... Mm -hmm. um, um, what about the corporate brand and the personal brand, how do they work together? Like, for example, I know, um, Lida, that you have a, you know, your, your Facebook pages, for example. You mm -hmm. have one that's your personal Facebook page, and then I think you have two that are actually business Facebook right. page. So how, how do we work that? How, how do you, how, you know, how do we look at the two? Well, so, so let me answer the first part of that, um, and because a lot of people are confused that if you work for a company, your job is to obviously promote the company or support the company, whatever that role is. Um, I have many clients who come to me at a point where either they, they started and built the company or they've worked for the company for a long time. And they say, I feel like I've done a good job of sort of shoring up the company name and reputation and brand, but I don't think people know who I am. And that happens all the time. So the first part of the question is, you know, should you be building your brand at the same time you're supporting your employer? Absolutely. I don't think any employer out there says, you know, I want you to be invisible. Just, you know, make, make sure I shine. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies bring me in to train their teams on how to build their own brands because they see the advantage that if, if all of my, you know, employees are in the community online or in person, talking about themselves and showing how wonderful they are, 
then it reflects positively on the company. So it, there's a win-win. But to your point about Facebook, you know, we're allowed to have rules and boundaries on social media. We're, we're allowed to. And I don't know why people thought that once you set up an online profile, you have to let everybody see everything. Now, the reality is if they really want to look hard enough, they can find everything. So nothing's private. But I have a personal Facebook page, which is where, you know, I'll show pictures of my puppies and vacations and, you know, th things that I'm doing, a new outfit I'm trying on. But I set up two different channels of business Facebook pages, which you can't have a business Facebook page unless you have a personal page. Yeah. But the two channels really speak to the two different audiences I serve because I serve an entrepreneur, executive, you know, global professional audience. And then I serve a military audience and there's some overlap. And so sometimes I'll cross post, but I keep them a little bit separate because the needs of, a, of somebody coming out of the military and trying to join the, the private sector are very specific and unique. And that might not relate to my executive audience. So I keep them a little bit separate. I don't share as much about my personal day-to-day -day life or cartoons and things I think are funny, not because they're not appropriate. I wouldn't care if anybody on my business page saw them, but because I try to keep the conversation more focused, that's the strategy I have for those. But I'll tell you, a lot of my clients, my media contacts, my colleagues, they're connected to me on the personal page. They follow, you know, they, they like, and they follow my pages. So they see the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm able to keep a little bit of separation. It's similar to LinkedIn, how you can have connections and you can have followers. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of separation. So if you want to share something that's more intimate, you don't have to broadcast it as much to the world, even though we always have to think about the fact that anybody can see anything we post. There's no such thing as private. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. I agree with that. No, thank you. Tell your that. kids that there's no such thing as private. <laughs> there is no, particularly when you put it on social media, there is no such thing as private. And once it's there, it's there. You know, you, you can't, you know, you can't do away with it. And you know, as you were talking, you you mentioned um, reputation, mm -hmm. right? Maybe let's talk a little bit. What's the difference between a brand and uh, and, and one's reputation? Well, and, and I'm guilty of this, right? We use the terms interchangeably. Um, I think it's just, maybe it's laziness. I don't know. But the way I like to explain it is personal brand is what you do. Reputation is what you earn. So personal brand is what I can put effort into and create a strategy and be focused. And reputation is what other people will feel about me. So okay. it, it, again, we use the terms interchangeably. I'm guilty of it. Almost every practitioner does, Pe individuals do, but think about it as one is something you can really control, which is how you're going to show up, how you're going to use all the different channels mm -hmm. to promote yourself and build your name and let people know what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And the reputation is what other people sort of assign you. And, mm -hmm. and the challenge with that is always that we can't control other people right? We might try, but we can't. <laughs> we literally cannot control other people um, because they're going to bring biases and stereotypes and judgments and preconceived ideas and their own experiences to how they evaluate us. Yeah. What brand does is it gives you the opportunity to control as many of those levers as are controllable. So whatever's within your power, now you have the ability to control. And if you do it right and the audience is receptive, that's where you're driving perception. Okay. I like that. Thank you for that, um, for that response. And uh, to our audience out there, if you have any questions, please um, um, share the questions with, and so that we will be able to, so that we address them. And if you have any insights or views about what we're talking about, we would love to engage with you. So please share. Um, please share um, so that we can, we can have a conversation with you. So now um, let's talk about um, how you build a personal brand. I think we've really spoken you know, quite a bit about what a personal brand is. But maybe let's talk about the elements or the steps that build a personal brand. What are they? Maybe let's talk about that. 
Well, obviously the first one is, is, is understanding values, right? Understanding values to be able to match them up to action in order to establish credibility mm -hmm. because a brand without trust, without credibility, without mm -hmm. getting credit, it doesn't work. And um, I have I have had so many people try to hire me that say I don't want to I don't want to do that part I want to do the part where you you know help me clean up Google <laughs> or something <laughs> like that It's like well it doesn't work that way You have to start foundationally right mm -hmm. Or people will say I just want to redo my LinkedIn mm -hmm. Can you just do that I don't want to do all the branding Well it's like picking out the drapery or the furniture and not having the house built right mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it's it. it it's a waste of time. So the first step is really, you know, what do I believe in? What do I stand for? Do, can I put action to it and, and build credibility? And then step two is understanding that everybody has a, a personal brand already. You already have a reputation. So what is it today? And this part is a little tricky for some people because it does require sort of taking an assessment of where you're starting from. And where you're starting from is your current brand. What do people think about you today? Mm -hmm. So if I were to go out and ask 10 people to give me three words to describe Nantu, would they all say the same thing? Mm -hmm. Would they say really different things? Where are the patterns in that? You know, we look for patterns, we throw out the, the outliers and we look at the patterns because that tells us kind of where we're starting from. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll be honest, when I did my own assessment and I was starting a business, I didn't love what I saw. Um, it, it was a little hard to swallow because mm -hmm. I had spent 20 years in the corporate world, you know, chasing success and things that I thought mattered. And yeah, sometimes I hadn't treated people right or behaved the way that I would be proud of. And I didn't know that until I was able to make myself vulnerable get this assessment, look at what people said and went, wow, well, that's not certainly not what I'm working toward. I mean, there was good stuff too. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It was a lot of good stuff, but it was those things that really mattered because the stuff isn't what matters to me. It's the experience people have. And so I've really focused in on that. Um, and it does, it makes you vulnerable. It, it's hard to hear sometimes, but I also find that what people offer up when you do an assessment of where you are is they offer up wonderful insights and gifts and ideas about where you could go. But the first step is taking, you know, the second step I should say is taking that assessment. As we talked about a little bit earlier, ideal state, end goal, legacy, what do you want your brand to look like? What, what kind of a reputation do you want people to feel you've earned, right? That you're credible for. That's where the power lies. That's probably the most powerful part of this whole process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I got strength to say, okay, maybe, you know, I've done great work and I'm very successful and I I've, have a lot of credibility, but I, my relationship piece needs to shore up. So I looked at my end goal the desired brand, the, the way I want people to perceive me. And I was able to create strategies to bring the differences into alignment. For a lot of people, when they do an assessment of where they are and they imagine what they want the end to look like, they're lined up, perfectly lined up. And people think, great, so they don't need to worry about personal branding. Quite the contrary, mm -hmm. because unless you can tell me exactly what you did every step of the way to make sure you have that great brand, you run the risk of hurting it or not replicating. So whether you're, you're where you are today and where you want to be are far apart, <coughs> excuse me, or they're close together, you still need to create a strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, strategy is really important. But the final piece in building the brand is not about you. It's about them and them is your target audience. So who does all this matter to? Who are the people, the communities, the companies, the individuals, the groups that need to get you, who need to find you compelling and relevant and interesting and attractive because they're ready to buy. They're ready to hire someone like you. They're ready to invest and they need to know about you. Who are those people? And when we can identify them, then we really start pulling apart. What do they need to know and what do they need to feel? 
because they might need to know that you've got experience, you've got track record, you're credentialed, you have a great resume, but they don't buy, remember, just on logic. The emotion has to be there. So how do you make them feel? Do you make them feel safe and validated and appreciated and heard and supported? If that's important to this audience that you've identified, then you need to be able to be those things. And if it's authentic to you to be those things, now you have a winning combination. And, and again, if it, it's very simple, right? I just walked you through some very simple steps, but it's not easy. And having a guide like yourself to walk somebody through that often takes a lot of the burden away because now you're not trying to create it for yourself. You have somebody helping you through that process. Mm -hmm. that, I love that. That's the brand new uh -huh. I like that. I like what you say. It's simple, but it's not easy. And, and, and the fact that it's, it's, you know, you've got to have a strategy. Like someone said, a, a, a brand, your brand is... It's, a, it's an asset. It's a strategic asset that needs to be managed. So you've got to manage it. It's something, it's got to be a plan. You know, you don't leave it to chance. You, you've got to tell your own story and, and, and actually literally, literally, you know, literally come up with a plan uh, because it's a strategic asset that, you know, you really need to manage. So maybe let's, let's personalize this a little bit. Um, okay. uh, how have you managed to differentiate yourself and stand out as a brand? Well, I think first and foremost, consistency. Um, I think I've been extremely consistent, um, even to the point where if I redo my website, I will look at all my social media and make sure it's all in alignment with a new vision or a new focus or a new message. Um, I, I've also been out there. And you and I were talking about, you know, some of the challenges of this year. And I think those of us have been that have been out there for a while, who've been curating you know, and, and populating content and ideas and conversations, we have an advantage that we've got some runway behind us. But I've been curating a lot of content. I've put a lot of content out there. Some works, some doesn't. I've I've been very strategic about the places that I have partnered. So I write for Entrepreneur Magazine. I write for Military.com. Those are leading publications in both of my spaces, right? Executive and, and military. I am very careful about the relationships and the partnerships and the people I associate with, people like you. You know, I'm very specific about that. And, and I'm sure you get asked a lot to do a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But being able to make those choices that are consistent with my brand are really where I believe I built a brand that's sustainable and scalable. And it has served me very well over 12 and a half years on my own as my own company. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just all online. It's not just all in person. It's not just how I dress or how I look. It's all of these touch points, how I speak about myself, how other people speak about me. All of those are consistent to give you, if you're my target audience, the impression of who you'd have a conversation with if we got on the phone together. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I mean, consistency, um, uh, uh, Lida, I, I must say, from the time that I got to know you, your message has been crystal clear. You've been very clear. You've been very consistent. You know, <laughs> you talk personal branding, you know, you, you're just so clear about your message. And, 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 uh, and I think definitely that's definitely one of the things that has, has, has enabled you to, to stand out because your message is very clear. And you also mentioned something about social media. Maybe let's just go into social media sure. a little bit. You know, so many times people think social media. Now, when you think personal branding, people think it's you know, social media. But it's, it's, it's <laughs> how can we leverage on it? Or how can we use social, social media to, to build our brands? Is there some kind of framework or strategy that we need to use to be able to build our brands on social media? Well, Certainly the strategy that your branding work would, would reveal 
is what's going to drive your social media. And, and I don't believe that it's a one size fits all, right? It, everybody shouldn't do the same thing. I have had clients that I have pulled back from social media because it wasn't part of their strategy, the positioning, the end state we were working towards. You know, there's several tools that we use. Social media and social networking are just one. But if you are going to be on there, just think about that word consistency, right? Are you using the same headshot across the professional platforms? Do you use the same tone of voice? Are you talking about the same things? You know, I'm passionate about personal branding and reputation management. I talk a lot about that. Even if I'm talking about unemployment numbers in the United States, I'm going to tie it back to personal branding and reputation management, because that's my lane to use your word, right? That's my specialty. So I consistently show up in those conversations. But the social media space is amazing and it's rich and rewarding and collaborative and informative. I mean, I get to have webinars with people that are in Africa. I mean, this is crazy, right? I just did a program in London and I'm sitting in my home in Colorado. So that all comes from social media. And so we have to use it strategically. And, and that's where, again, the one place that I probably don't use it as strategically to build my brand is my private Facebook. It's not that private, but that's where I'll share things that aren't on brand, right? Um, my puppies did something cute. I'll put it there. But if it's LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, or my business Facebook accounts, you're going to see a lot of consistency. And I use them differently. So if the message is more warm and inviting, I might put it on Facebook or Instagram. If it's more tactical and informational, I might put it on LinkedIn. So using the platforms for what they were designed to do is also really helpful. But, you know, going back to the loop of authenticity, I mean, I, I had some big news yesterday and I was giddy. I was literally giddy with, with delight. And I shared that that way on all these platforms because that's authentic to me, right? It isn't authentic to me to write an academic post about something that inside I'm just like, oh my God, I'm so excited, <laughs> you know? So it's okay to break character every once in a while and just let people know that I'm really excited about this and, and you've supported me so much that I wanna share this with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, consistency is really king and confidence. And, 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 and I like that. And I mean, um, the other day, you actually mentioned something about a framework where mm -hmm. you said um, something to do with know, feel, mm -hmm. and... And do. <laughs> do. Yes. So please right. talk a little bit about that. Well, because, um, more and more now, you know, amid the global yeah. lockdowns, you know, people are online. We are trying to build brands online. We're trying to build businesses online. And uh, they, you know, we're just posting left, right, and center just to try and get our brands and our products and our services out there. I, I'm sure there is some kind of framework, some kind of you know, an orderly way, for, for lack of a better word, to put it so that it's effective and building our brands. Right, and and anything you do marketing wise should always be measured, right? We want to know if it's working. Are we getting the result that we're hoping for? And oftentimes, what I find is people don't know what result they're looking for, so they don't know if they're getting it. Right? It's it's if you remember the story of the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy gets to the fourth fork in the road and she asks the Cheshire Cat, "Which way do I go?" And he said, "Well, where are you headed?" She said. I don't know, because then it really doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter which way you go. So, you know, this is a lot of time we're going to spend building a brand online. So it should be measurable. It should be strategic. And and we should analyze the, the, the measurements and the results. So mm -hmm. what I was speaking to you about is instead of just throwing content, right, more and more and more, have a goal in mind for every post, every campaign, every share, every contribution. And the, the metric is, what do I want my audience to know about me or about the topic? What do I want them to feel about me or the topic? And what do I want them to do with this information? Do I want them to like it? Do I want them to share it? Do I want them to call me? 
and get more information? Do I want them to talk to somebody sitting next to them about this, right? If you think about your, your strategic posts, and that's why I say that little bit of Facebook that's just for me, I don't think this way necessarily, but everything else does. What is the expectation I have on that, on that result? And then if I'm sharing something that I'm expecting people will share and nobody shares it, I know that something, something broke down in my, in my thought process, right? Something didn't work. Um, if, I, if I want them to like it and all they did was share it, well, that's great. But again, I was measuring something different. So when you start thinking of social media this way, whether you're a small business or you're looking for a job, it's important to start thinking about how can I measure and monitor the results? You know, we think it's all likes. We think that if people like our stuff, that somehow we're getting results. But if they're liking and not doing anything else, what does that really mean? Yeah. Good points. Yeah. Um, definitely good points. And uh, I hope we're in the audience is taking notes because mm -hmm. we do, many of us um, just post and once you get 100 likes, you think, you know, I've, I've done it. And yet, you know, you want to look at, okay, what's, what do I want to accomplish, you know, by, by posting this, which is good. Now, my Timber Love says sustainable and scalable brand. Please explain um, scalability. Yeah, I throw these terms out and then people don't know what I mean, right? Thank you for calling me on that. Um, <laughs> what I mean is sustainable means it's, it's going to keep living, right? A brand isn't a short-term thing. It, it's got to be a living entity and it's got to be fluid, meaning as I evolve, as I mature, as I grow, my brand has to be able to go with me. It has to be able to sustain uh, challenges, opportunities and growth along with me. And what I mean by scalable is, you know, if, it, if it's just a private thing and I'm a best kept secret, well, that doesn't really give me the result I'm looking for. My goal is to impact as many people as I can with this message around the world, future generations, all of these. So scalable means being able to take it as big as I want, scale it as much as I want and make sure it can be sustained and it can continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for asking me to clarify that. That makes so much sense. Thanks for that. And then Esther says, so it's important that you know your target audience in creating your brand. True. What steps do you take to change your brand when you are transitioning, for example, from corporate mm. to entrepreneurship? Uh, I love that question because I talk a lot about that in this book that's coming out next, uh, next May. That's the concept of pivoting, right? Mm -hmm. And we all need to know our target audience and our target audience might change or we might change focus. So if our target audience changes, um, let's face it, if you were in the travel business, this might've been a really hard year to build your career in the travel business or hospitality or here in the States, the restaurant service business. Um, they're, they've been horribly impacted by this pandemic. So you might need to change your audience. You might need to think about focusing on different people. But if you're changing, if you're moving from corporate to entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship into corporate or, you know, being a doctor, going to being a business owner, whatever the change is, sometimes your target audience changes too. And it's important to understand what this new audience is, as well as how many of your previous audience can go with you really thinking about them as people, you know, in marketing, we call it personas. But but when you think about the ideal client for you, let's say, um, in Esther's case, she is being becoming an entrepreneur, who is the customer or the client that you really want to find you? If you're targeting investors, who are the investors that you want to get really excited about what you're doing? Who are the business partners, the strategic alliances that you really want to find you? Some of those may come from your corporate life, your corporate relationships. Some of them may not. So it's important to understand what do they stand for? What do they believe in? What are they passionate about promoting? Because target audience, you know, when we find the people that are aligned with us, work just becomes easy. And I'm all for easy. Right? I love easy. So I don't try to convince people that they need what I have. I, there are enough people who find me who say, I love what you're doing. 
I like your style. I like your energy. I like the way you're authentic. I want to work with you. Great. Those are the people I want to work with. People who are going to be difficult, who are going to challenge me, who, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't need that in my life when there's an abundance of people who are ready to get to work and do the hard work to build their reputation. So target audience is a lot about what you don't want as well as what you do want and have that ideal customer, that ideal investor, that ideal employer in mind as you have every conversation. And then you're asking yourself, does this feel like the kind of person I would enjoy working with? I know when I enjoy working with my clients, I do I do my best work and I, I go above and beyond. And so I look for more of that. Yeah. Right? That's why it's really important. Mm -hmm. Well, so much to take in. Thank you for that um, response, um, um, Lida. Maybe let's, we you know, we, we, we spoke about a brand, right? And then we, we said social, social media is a tool, okay, to showcase um, your brand. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about other tools that are there um, besides social media. What other tools are there that we can actually use to showcase who we are? I, I always recommend five. Mm -hmm. And the strategy that you design after you do the branding work, the strategy decides and designs which ones go first, which ones get more effort, but all five get used. You don't get to just pick the one you like or the one that feels safest or easiest. People try to do that. The first is narrative and narrative is language. Narrative is storytelling, um, which is why I love that my next book is called Control the Narrative because it's all about, it means all about how we control the stories that are told about us, right? And narrative is language. It's the language we speak. It's the language other people speak when they talk about us our elevator pitch, our key messaging, everyone lives in that, all of those live in the bubble of narrative. Mm -hmm. Narrative starts with what you tell yourself. So self-talk is actually the first part of narrative. Because if you're telling yourself, I got this, I can do this, I believe in myself. The second part is narrative is what you tell other people right? So if I'm telling myself good, healthy, positive, confident messages, that influences what I'm telling other people. And the third step is, what are other people telling other people? So if I'm telling myself healthy messages, and, and that shows up in how I'm talking to other people, it will show up in how they're talking about me when I'm not in the room. So narrative is the first. Social networking is a form of networking and social networking is certainly one of the tools that most of us are using right now because we're quarantined um you know all we have is our friends on zoom and and Streamyard and facebook and and so we're doing a lot of social networking but it's only one and we've talked a lot about the, the ways that you build strategy around that the third camp Oh, there's my book. Yay. I love that book. <laughs> um, May 21st, <laughs> you know, get on my newsletter list and I will make sure you know when that book comes out. Um, but uh, networking is really important because networking is relationship, right? You and I met six years ago. We stayed in touch. I've watched your career grow. I hope I've helped you along the way. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, and and that's, that's relationship, right? Yeah. When, mm -hmm. when networking is both direction, so you get a benefit and I get a benefit, mm -hmm. then it's a winning situation. Mm -hmm. If all I'm doing is helping you and I don't get any benefit, even if the benefit is just feeling good and, and knowing I have a friend on the other side of the world, mm -hmm. um, if there's no benefit to me, that's not networking. Networking mm -hmm. is always two direction and networking, I mean, mm -hmm. Boy, it can help you find a job. It can help you get investors. It can help you in any aspect of your life and career because these are the people who believe in you, support you, advocate, refer, endorse you. They're like your sales team. So networking is critical. The last two somewhat go hand in hand, but it has to do with presence. So your image, your style, the way you present yourself, the way you dress, um, and then your body language. Do you make good eye contact? You know, if I did this entire program looking over here, that would send a very different message, right? <laughs> um, 
Or if I said to you, oh, Nonto, I'm so excited to be here with you today, right? My body language isn't speaking, <laughs> isn't speaking consistently. So our, our tone, our body language, our choice of words, how we present ourselves, the people we know, how we engage online, those are all touch points. And mm -hmm. they don't get to just get separated. You know, you and I had a conversation about how sometimes it's easy to think what we do is image consulting, right? Helping people yeah. pick out an outfit. <laughs> and, yeah. and as I've just shared, that's one piece of it. Because if you don't present yourself with confidence or self-respect and appropriate to the situation, then the brand starts becoming in question. But it's such a it's one fifth of the marketing tools marketing that we tools. use to build a brand. So it's not branding all by itself. And I think that's important to bring up. Thank you for those, um, 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 for those points, um, Lita. And, you know, narrative, social networking, I think Noma Timber is, 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 is always, also came up with controlling the narrative. Um, those are really great um, insights. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe let's let's talk about. Um, I mean, we've we've spoken about um, the past, and uh, we've spoken about the present. Maybe before we move to that, let's talk about now. How you know, with with, with everything that's happened with the pandemic and the way you know it's changed our lives, um, changed the way we do things. How can we remain? relevant as a brand you know how can you remain relevant despite the disruption and everything that has happened in the last few months how can you remain a relevant brand you know i i i it's a great question it's a question a lot of us are an, are, are asking and answering and i actually wrote an article back in i think it was April or probably April or May uh, for Entrepreneur Magazine about how do we build brand if we're not face to face? Mm -hmm. Because that's so much of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't mean more is better. <laughs> and I think that's what we see a lot of people doing, right? Pushing content, mm -hmm. inundating messages, making sure mm -hmm. that if you happen to log on, you're going to see my face. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't necessarily always the best strategy because people are exhausted. People are frustrated. People are scared. People want human connectedness. And just showing up in my feed constantly doesn't mean that I perceive you better. I think the, the people that are getting stickiness of brand, which is where brands really start working, we call it sticky, um, are the ones that are, are sharing everything consistent with their brand, but a little bit more diversity of thought. So, um, you know, are there people that you're mentoring that are struggling with something? Could that struggle be something somebody else is struggling with, in which case you write an article or a blog or you do a video on that? Um, really reaching in and pulling forward those assets that you have, those ideas, those thoughts, those processes. You know, a lot of people have completely changed their businesses. And, and that makes sense for them. Again, if you were in an industry that's non-existent right now, uh, you've had to do that out of necessity. But there are ways to, to pivot without necessarily changing too. And pivoting doesn't mean, again, just throwing tons of information. Um, you and I were talking about the fact that, I mean, I used to be on stage five or six times a month in different cities and traveling constantly. And now I'm, I'm based here. So making sure that I'm still able to deliver that message and still able to engage my audience and bring them in and look at different platforms, it, it requires me to do the work, not my audience. Not, they're not going to do the work. They're going to find somebody who meets their needs. So I think just keep in mind that it's about being relevant, not always just being visible. Visible. That's, yeah. that's very true. And I think also what I'm getting is, it's 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 not about it goes back to it's not about me, it's about them. You know what what are their needs? What do people want? What are they experiencing? And you need to be relevant. You know in that situation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share I'll share one thought to kind of put a pin in that one. Um, you know I I'm, I've struggled always with how much to share. Right. Um, I did a piece last year also for Entrepreneur 
called How Much Do We Need to Share on Social Media in Order to Be Authentic and Build a Brand, right? Because sometimes people think I have to tell everybody everything. And a lot of people during this pandemic, they shared a lot of information that I don't know that they would have shared otherwise. <laughs> but they were lonely or sad or scared or frustrated. And so they shared all of this. Um, I have found one of the things, cause again, you watch for results. One of the things I have found in the last eight months is when I do share something that's extremely authentic, people engage more. Yes, that's so true. And yeah. it's always been, I, I've always known that in my head, but it's hard sometimes, right? The the post I made yesterday about, oh my God, I'm so excited, you know, and I was literally doing a happy dance. People got excited with me, you know, and they shared that with me. I don't post doom and gloom messages about despair and frustration because that's not my brand. Mm -hmm. And I and I also don't want it out there because I don't want to be thinking about that. But but authentic posts where you're telling people how you feel about something. Those are working really well and they work well anyway, but right now, because we need to connect with people, they're working well, especially. I agree, yeah, I agree with that. Thank you for that. Now, Rufara says, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs that have kickstarted their own business during this pandemic? Oh, first of all, good for you. Um, I started my business in 2008. And if you remember 2008, I'm sure it was in Africa, like it was in the US. It was a horrible economic climate. Um, you know, everyone I knew was losing their jobs, losing their homes. People were panicked. Nobody knew what to do. And I started a business, right? Looking back, I don't know what I was thinking, but it was, it was good. <laughs> and there are people who are going to start businesses this year and next year because the market timing is perfect. And then there are people who, you know, can't make it even if the market is good. So I wouldn't use the pandemic as an excuse. Now, if you want to start a tourism business, that might be a little challenging. Uh, or you want to build a hotel, My, at least in the States and some other countries, it's very hard right now. But look for the opportunity, right? So even if your business, let's say um, I heard of a young entrepreneur the other day who was taking um, raw materials and making beautiful earrings, exotic earrings out of them, big statement pieces. And, you know, so, okay, they're earrings. You can sell earrings in any market. But what she did that was so brilliant is she said, you know, we're all behind a computer right now. And a lot of us are feeling like, we don't have a reason to put on, you know, makeup or or get dressed in the morning. We can just sit in front. We can do our work. Nobody sees us. We don't go to an office. My earrings will make you feel special and beautiful and glamorous, even if you're, you know, stuck at home wearing jeans because you can't go to your office. And so she took, she took her idea and she applied it to the market. I did that similar thing. When people got locked down, I said, hey, I've got these courses on LinkedIn Learning. I have eight courses. Since you have time, why don't you start taking them? You know, And people did. They thought, that's a great idea. I didn't think about that. So if you already have a product, uh, how can you modify the messaging to make it applicable now? And if you're building a product or a service or an idea, how can you tailor it to the market now? Even if it's just short term, to meet the needs of where people are during this time. And when we come out of this, you go back to your original business plan. You've got to be sensitive to what the market needs when it needs it. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Rufaro, I hope you were answered there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, um, um, the, number 10 says the pandemic is not an excuse. Look for the opportunity. Yes, and the opportunities are there. There's just so many opportunities and and if you do look around, I mean, just as simple, the masks that we are wearing every day, you know, that's a business that people have just leveraged on and many people have made lots of money from it. So the opportunities are there, the opportunities are there. So now we've spoken so much about how you build a brand and maybe, you know, one has done that, you've built a brand and you've done everything, you've followed the steps and then boom, you know, life happens and you make this grave mistake publicly and uh, everything just falls apart. <laughs> <sighs> what you've built, you know, over the years and just minutes just crumbles. 
Mm -hmm. Can how does one repair, you know, or can it be repaired? Can your reputation be repaired once you have, you know, you have really right. messed up publicly? Well, of course it can. Um, in in most cases, um, there have been extreme cases where it is literally uh, unprecedented and, and the person has to use extreme measures. And I, and I cover that in this next book because this next book really talks about reputation repair. And, and I have worked with many amazing people all over the world, <laughs> thank you, um, all over the world who have made a mistake or didn't think something through, whether it was a careless mistake or a conscious mistake. Because sometimes, you know, we know better, but we do it anyway. There's also a category of people who've had their reputation damaged who didn't do anything wrong. And I used to think that that was Hollywood stuff, right? We saw it in movies, but it really happens. And I have met some of the most amazing people from you know, Ireland and the US and Australia and Canada who have literally been doing everything right and for some reason, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time or got caught up in a, a public situation that was not their fault and their reputation is tarnished. The process is, is, is very painful to repair reputation. I, I'm the first one to admit it. It requires a lot of really deep soul searching, accountability where it has to be there, and then deciding a strategy that's unique to the person. So no two clients of mine have ever had the same strategy, whether it's building or repairing a reputation. Um, but but the thing you said that that is a little bit different is a lot of times the people I work with and I have to help are, are not building a brand before that. They haven't really thought about it. Maybe they were a doctor or a professor or you know, a, a technician or a scientist and they never thought about brand building. And now they're in a position where they have a crisis. Something, you know, if you look at Google, everything is negative. Everything is headlines. And they scramble to figure out what to do. So the, the way you phrased it was they do everything right. They're building their brand, one mistake. One mistake unless it is literally that big, doesn't typically bring somebody's brand down. Um, you know, owning it right away, taking full accountability. Let's say you thought a joke was funny. You put it on Twitter. It was offensive, inappropriate, insensitive, whatever, and you got a lot of backlash. Well, if you had a big community that supported you, they're going to come to your defense you can pull it down and own it. It's still there. I mean, cause everything lives on the internet, but you can own it and say, you know what? I made a mistake. I thought this was funny. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it won't happen again. And as long as it doesn't, because you have enough consistency, enough content, it doesn't. Um, I, I know when I first published my first book for the military, which is your next mission, I hated the fact that I had to charge for that book. I hated it because I didn't want a veteran to have to pay for a book. And I actually, when I was posting about it, somebody called me out on that. And they said, if you're so generous and you care so much about veterans, how can you make them pay for this? And it hurt. I was so upset by that because that was my big fear. But in the time I was trying to think about what to say, so many men and women, came to my rally and they said, she has to print the book. She had to write the book. She has to mail the book. Like it's $25, like you can buy a book. And I didn't have to say anything except thank you to them because they knew me and they knew the consistency of my brand and they came to my own defense. So it's not one little mistake typically that, you know, um, torpedoes some somebody's career. Usually it's bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so now is there maybe just quickly, <laughs> if, if your, your reputation has actually been damaged, what are the steps? What, what, what does one need to do to, 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 to build it and, and repair that reputation? Well, and, and I apologize. It's a big conversation. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to try and just give you a couple of the highlights. Yeah. I, can't, I can't give a one size fits all because it's mm -hmm. it's not as easy as, you know, hire a PR term, uh, firm and, and do a press release. Um, 
first is understanding what actually happened, right? Mm -hmm. How, how damaging is this? Is this something that could blow over? Um, is it something that you're going to lose patients or clients because like understanding and, and doing an assessment and, and that takes a trained professional to do in part of that as part of that is separating emotion from fact, because sometimes we get our feelings hurt. That doesn't mean our reputation is damaged. So understanding, you know, emotion from fact, uh, understanding what the drivers are. So if this is a set of negative posts on a, a, like a site like Glassdoor, that can really hurt a business. Um, and it can hurt an executive if you're called out. But if you made a mistake and posted the wrong thing on Twitter and you took it down and apologized. So, you know, the assessment of, of what is the damage, kind of a triage is first. And then looking at what the options are. So um, I worked with a medical doctor who was a very high profile case. Um, there really was no path forward. There was no path forward for this person to continue to practice medicine under that name in the way that they had done it. Um, the assessment just revealed that what had happened was too egregious, too much sensational, regardless of whether they waited a while. Um, so there were some extreme measures. I mean, they actually left medicine, um, became a writer, but they considered changing their name even because it was that high profile. Unfortunately, this person was very recognizable. So that didn't look like a good solution. But then looking at those five levers that we have and saying, which ones are we going to use first? How are we going to use them? What is the order we're going to use them? When do we go to social media? Most people's first response when something goes wrong is they take all their social media down. So the only thing on the internet is the bad stuff, right? <laughs> Not a good thing to do. Um, so, you know, there's, there's websites that can be built. There's blogs that can be built that are not only meta tagged and SEO tagged, but that can really start telling the other side of the story. Sometimes that's a good, a good choice. Sometimes it's not. So I don't want to give anybody the impression that you follow these steps and your reputation is fine because every case has different variables. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Lida. Now uh, we're running out of time and so we have to put this, kind of draw it to a close. So my next question really is um, about the future. You know, we've spoken about the past, we've spoken about the present. In your opinion, I know it's a little bit broad, but what would you say is the future of personal branding? I think it's probably gonna get more personal. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to, what, what we saw in this pandemic was people, as I said, being vulnerable, being yeah. raw, being real. And for some people that really grew their followership, it grew their communities, it grew visibility for their business. And so they'll probably want to continue to do more of that. Um, but it's all about being authentic. And the days of scrubbing a social media profile and making it look perfect and airbrushed and, you know, backlit beautifully, those days are gone. We look for real people. And yes. I'm excited about that because real people are so much more interesting than, you know, the facade. Yes, I agree with that. And, you know, I read something from um, Mark Schaefer. And he says the future of branding your products is personal branding. And he shares some, some thoughts about human impressions. He says something about how, you know, in the past, um, our businesses were built through accumulation of you know, advertising impressions, but now more and more it's about human impressions. And if, and if you look around, you'll find, you know, these organizations that have really grown in the last few years. It's really about how people engage and how they're actually connecting to to say the the founder of the brand so they may be um somehow connect with his that person's imperfections or what they believe in or you know what they stand for and people gravitate towards that so i think more and more you know human impressions really uh, are going to continue uh, if at all they actually increase how um impact how people actually what brands they 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 they, 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 they gravitate towards or the services that they go after um, and I think it's also an advantage for, for you know, your small businesses because most of the times small businesses, you know, you know, the, the founder of the business is the brand. And so once people have a relationship with the founder and they engage with them, it's easier to 
to kind of grow that business because of that you know, of human questions. So I think um, the future for personal branding is, is bright. <laughs> good, good, definitely. <laughs> I think it's bright. Um, I don't know if there's in um, to our audience again. I don't know if there's anybody with a quick question. Um, my last question to you, really, uh, Linda, is um, 2020, right? 20, what year is this? 2020 is going to a close, and um, January 2021, the year 2021 is around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do in the first months of 2021 to set up our personal brands for success next year and beyond? I would say, first of all, understand that it's happening, whether you're driving the car or not. So why not get behind the driver's wheel seat, right? Um, and the steering wheel and, and be in control and, and start paying attention to those five areas, narrative, networking, social networking, image, and body language, and how you're making decisions, right? You and I decided what we were going to wear for this broadcast, people decide what they're gonna, um, how they're gonna introduce themselves when they get on a Zoom call and everybody introduces themselves. They decide what picture they're gonna post on social media. Start becoming conscious of the decisions you're making. And as you build your brand, make sure that, that that brand matches up with the decisions. If you're struggling in one of those decisions, it's probably because it doesn't align with your brand. So find a way to make that align. Um, reach out, ask for help, connect with people. We're social beings, and this is hard on everybody to be isolated. So find ways to connect with people. If you can do a Zoom call and see somebody's face, that, that might be way better than just sending an email or a text message and, and use social media strategically. I would say if you were doing those things in the first few months, you would find much better results from your brand. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, thank you very much for, for, um, for that advice and um, the final word. Really. And I know people out there probably want to know how to get in touch with you. You actually spoke about a newsletter. How do we subscribe? How do we... No, do people get in touch with you? Sure. So lita360.com, L-I-D-A 360.com is my home base. That's my website. Um, you can see all my videos, all my articles, everything's on there. And I'm also very active on LinkedIn. So can certainly connect there. The subscription, right? Lita 360. Um, the subscription to my newsletter is on the contact page of my website. And we are ramping that up as of January. We're going to be adding a ton of content around personal branding, cheat sheets, checklists, all sorts of tips, videos, uh, really building that out. We've been working for a few months on that. So we're excited. Wow, that's incredible. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Lisa. This has just been amazing and so much to take in. And I benefited from this conversation. And I'm sure um, so many of the, our audience benefited from the conversation too. And we're looking forward to reading the book, Control the Narrative. Me too. So, um, <laughs> Control the narrative. So we, we all, you know, we're really looking forward to, to to reading up. And like I said today, you know, there's so much that we spoke about, but like you said, it's just, it's, you know, we've just scraped the surface. We, there's more to it, and um, and so we're really looking forward to reading the book. Good. So to our audience out there, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for engaging. Vu says this is a lot of great information. Thanks, Lida and Nanto Wazo. Thank, thank you, Vu. You. For thank you. In. Uh, really appreciate it. And Noma Temba says, great session. Thank you. And thank you, Noma, for joining us as well. So it's really been great to have you all. And um, Lida, thank you so much. I hope this is just the, the beginning of uh, um, many conversations we'll have. Absolutely. And Noma says, can't wait for the book. Yes, we all can't wait for the book. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, so it's been great. And um, Dombi says, thanks, ladies. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you for having us, and uh, this is Nonto Masubu. I am an African, and proudly so. Cheers for now. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>